Great. So now we're all set up. Um, I'd like to thank you again for making the time to call in for this conference call. The purpose of the call is really just to touch base and to see if anybody has any questions about the avenues to Jewish engagement for intermarried couples and their families matching grant initiative. Um, the last time we spoke was, or we had the opportunity to speak, was a while ago. It was in the fall. And so now we decided that it was a long time between our last event, which was an afternoon of learning. I hope that some of your funders came to that. And I know some of you were in the room at that event as well. Um, and then the deadline, which is March 15th. So we decided that we needed to have an opportunity to touch base and to answer any questions that you may have in the interim while you're working on your applications. I'm happy to, I'm just gonna advance the slides one because you all have called in and that's fantastic. Um, as a reminder, this is the timeline that we're talking about. Um, as we said, the deadline for applications is March 15th. It's coming very, very soon, and I know many of you are hard at work on your application if you haven't finished it already. Just to draw your attention to our website, I will be sending around a PDF of the application, which if you haven't seen it on the website, will allow you to look at all of the questions before you start filling it out online in that way. If you want to write it in or you want to type it up and then cut and paste, you can absolutely do that. Um, as the slide says, we are anticipating making our grant decisions and announcements by probably the, the announcements will be made end of May, early June, and then I will be back in touch with the grant, all of you as grantees to those of you as, who are grantees to make sure that to verify all of your gifts before we we make we make those disbursements. Um, as far as questions go, there aren't a lot of slides today. This is really an opportunity for all of you. So what would be really helpful to me is if you uh, if you'd like to ask a question, if you either click the hands raised button on your con in your conference window or type your question in the chat box in the on the left hand side and I will read the questions that come in and I will read the questions that come in and answer them as we go so that's really the timeline that we're looking at um, as you know we have a very extensive frequently asked questions that page on our website, which I'm sure many of you have, most of you have been to, and you can contact me at any time. My contact information is on the screen. You've seen it in many, many, many emails, and I'll be sending it around again just in case somebody needs it or has missed it or what have you. So really, what the next this is going to be quick. This guys, this is going to be quick if you don't have any questions. Um, the next slide, please advance, is a quick infographic that we created about funders and gifts being eligible for matching funds. Um, I will also send this PDF around so you have it. You'll be able to give it out to any applicable staff and donors. And we think it covers many of the questions we've been asked, but if it doesn't, please let me know and we will address those as well. I'd like to, at this point, open it up to questions. If people have, they want to raise their hands or type it in the chat box, we can start answering your questions because that's really what this call is for today. Eliza, are you on the phone? Can you tell me what number you're at so I can unmute you? All right. Um, for those of you who have your hands raised, um, please, please, for those of you who have your hands raised, please type in the box, what, chat to me what your phone number is so I can unmute you and you can ask your question. The questions I have in the chat box right now are from Ariel. Does the donor need to be a new donor to the organization? The answer is no. 
Um, the donor can be a returning donor, but there are restrictions in terms of what their gift needs to be. So if a donor is a returning donor, they would need to – we're asking them to at least double their gift to your organization and also be giving a minimum of $25,000. So for example, if you have a $10,000 donor, we would need them to bump up to twenty-five. I hope that's clear. Um, the next question is from Nathaniel. If a person used to give to, through their foundation and now wants to write a personal check, is that a new donor? It's, I'm going to take that question and clarify it for you um, because I don't want to give you the wrong answer. Our, Josh Gold, our initiative is going through some large changes. We received an increase in funding from the foundation. Would this make us eligible? Um, you know what? I don't want to do this anymore. Uh, I don't want to do this this way. I'd like, there aren't that many of us on the phone. I'm going the conference to, has been unmuted. I'm going to unmute this. So if you guys could mute on your end, that would be really helpful so we don't have the background noise. Um, Josh, can you? Ask your question with more um, information, please. Yeah, so um, we're an initiative of a community foundation um, in Denver, yep. and uh, we got an increase in our funding for the next two years, um, but we're making some changes that will be geared towards interfaith families and couples. Um, so would that make us eligible? I think that it would, but maybe we should talk offline about the, uh, okay. the specifics. Okay. Okay, I'll follow up with you after the call. Thank you. No problem. Um, I'm just taking some notes as we go, you guys. Um, Eliza, do you have a question? Uh, don't worry about it. If I if I think of it, I'll um, come back and write it. Now my screen is unfrozen. Okay, great. Um, Thank you. Oh, I see that. I see that now. Um, Karen, I have to take your question. Um, that's a, that's not a decision that I can make. Maxine, are you on the line? I am. Maxine, do you see Karen's question, or do you need me to read it? Uh, could you read it? I'm not actually in front of my computer. I'm sure. sorry. Karen McGinnity asked the question, it's a challenge to find a single donor able to commit to $25,000, especially for a startup. Is there any flexibility? Uh, so t uh, two, there's two parts to it, I guess. Uh, one of the requirements is uh, your organization has to have been in existence for a few years. So I, you know, I don't know how startup it is, but um, yeah, definitely it, it's a challenge. Um, you know, I, I would encourage um, you to submit your application, and uh, we can take a look at it because it may be a circumstance we want to uh, look into further. Um, we had said that in certain instances we <coughs> would take more than one donor uh, if there are new increased donors, and um, they would, you know, be uh, eligible from that perspective. Um, so. Uh, I don't know if you have a further question, but that's where we would be in terms of uh, looking at it initially. Okay, great. Karen, does that help? I'm not sure if she's on. Um, okay, great. Yes, they, that helps. Um, fantastic. Mike, Michael, do you want to ask your, call, your question to the entire line? Um, sure. I was just wondering if we, um, as an organization, have existing donors who give to uh, to our operating um, our annual campaign each year, and we now have a new initiative for interfaith couples and families. Do they have to those donors have to double the gift that they've been giving to us, or since this is a new program and initiative, would that count as a new donation coming from that donor? One second, I'm sorry. Um. I'm just rereading. I'm reading your question as you were asking it. Um, we have been we have been going on 
that yes, that would be if if they are giving and to a new initiative, that is a new gift. Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, Diane, when do gifts need to be paid by? We need you need to have your cash in hand by December first. We need documentation of that gift being paid by December first. Um, that's really the that's really where we're at. I mean, as Maxine said, we are December first, 2016. Sorry for sorry for not specifying the year. Um, gifts have to be pledged after August 31st. Um, which is when the initiative launched, August 31st of 2015, which is when the initiative launched, and need to be paid up by December 1st. And as we've said before, in order to apply, you need to know how much you're asking for. So you would need to know that a donor is committed to a minimum of $25,000 before you apply. Um, Ariel, do you want to ask your question? To the, to the line? Um, yes, sure. So my question is, we have a, a foundation that supports our organization with a large annual grant. Um, it's about 200000 a year. And so I was thinking if we um, applied for the JFN matching grant for, let's say, 25000 and we asked the foundation that already supports us for another 25000 would that be eligible for a matching grant, or does it not count as a big enough increase? Hold on. I'm trying to make sure I understand your question. You have a large annual donation. Just let me make sure I have it correct. You have a if you were to apply with their gift as a matching grant as the matching gift. Or have well, they they're, they're, they they would give what they give anyway. They would continue giving, let's say, the two hundred thousand. Right. But they would say, okay, we're willing to increase our gift with twenty five. If if through this twenty five, you'll get another twenty five from the JFN matching gift. I'm going to mull that one over a little bit unless you have something you want to say, Maxine. Um, so, you know, the, the, I, I'll, I'll speak in a general term and then sure. talk specifically. In a general term, part of what we're trying to do here is in, encourage increased philanthropy. So if doing this is going to encourage increased philanthropy, uh, from your donor, and particularly if they will continue to increase their philanthropy, uh, we'd be favorable to looking at it. Yeah, in this case, that would be the case. Okay, great. Um, but we could always apply, and then you can look, you can look at it, and we can discuss it later. Precisely, precisely. That's what I would encourage you to do. Um, Um, so gifts don't need to be doubled then? No, they still do. But we, we can have a conversation about that offline. Um, you know, and I, I would say, Melissa, if I could just add, please. yes, the rule is a gift should be doubled. But I, I think what Melissa and I are both trying to say is, there may be some exceptions to circumstances, and we'll you know, have to look at it in terms of um, what the specific circumstances are, and that's why it's sometimes really hard to specifically answer the question. Right. Um, you know, and I'll, I'll say, for example, somebody had asked before, can it be more than one donor for the 25? My answer would be yes, but it can't be seven donors. So, you know, I, I think that, you know, we're looking for something that's going to encourage uh, responsible philanthropy and you know so if, if for example you know people have talked about doing giving circles um, but we've discouraged people from doing a giving circle for twenty five thousand dollars because it's there they get then you end up with very small gifts so you know we're looking for something that's more meaningful in terms of encouraging ongoing philanthropy thanks Maxine um, I'm just looking to see. Um, I have a question about in-kind support. And as it says on your, or it should say on your screen if you're looking, um, gifts that are eligible are cash or equivalent, so checks, wire transfers, or transfers of publicly traded stock. Everything, 
everything else is not. That's what we're really we're really holding to. Um, Michael, to clarify the infographic on the screen, if we want to create an endowment fund with the restricted purpose to support interfaith family initiatives on an ongoing basis, can we commit funds through this matching grant to do that? That one, I'm, that one specifically, Michael, I'm going to take and get back to you offline, if you don't mind. Um, Thank you. It's a, it's an excellent question, um, and I like, I really like the idea of the ongoing, of the ongoing funding. So we really, we really need to talk about that amongst ourselves. Um, one of the questions I've been getting, a, we've been getting a lot, is about JFN membership, and while if you are, if your donor is U.S. U.S. based. We have said the norm is for that donor to join. However, um, and I can go through the process of how we're going to do that in a second. However, I do want to be clear that your donor does not have to join until unless, unless you are awarded a matching grant. We want to be really clear about that. We know that some people are having some, um, there's some hesitation about broaching that subject. So we want, I want to be clear that that is something that can wait to happen. Once the grant decisions are made, we can talk about JFN membership. However, the way we are doing due diligence on these, match, on these applications is once you apply with all of the donor information that we've asked you to provide, I will be having a con what I will be doing is having a conversation which, with each of your donors. Um, just to get to know them a little better, um, obviously confirm the gift that they're giving to you, find out why they're interested in funding you, et cetera. Um, I will be having a conversation. Part of that conversation will include information about JFN and laying the groundwork for joining if your, if your application is funded. But again, I do want to be clear that that's something that we'll follow up with them about if if you are if your grant is approved, hope that's clear. If that's cl not clear, please let me know. Um, does anyone else have other questions? Everybody's unmuted, so if you have something, you can voice it. Do non-U.S. donors have to also join JFN? Sorry, who's speaking? Ariel. Thank you. Um, yeah, when you voice when you ask the question, if you wouldn't mind just saying who you are, that would be really helpful. Um, <laughs> Non-U.S. donors do not have to join JFN, although we certainly would welcome them. We would definitely welcome them. We're a global organization, and we have members all over the world. So we certainly, we certainly encourage everyone to join, but it's not a requirement. Hi. Sorry, who, who's asking? It's Eliza. Hi, Eliza. Go ahead. Hi. Um, okay, so I thought I would ask a question now, and then we can follow up offline. Sure. Um, so I understand the eligibility of the organization has to be in existence for two years. Three. Um, I'm saying three years. Okay, three years. Three years. Uh, sorry. Um, I'm, I'm saying this question to the group because I thought it might apply to someone on the line. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't, I'm part of, I founded an organization only six months ago, so it's clearly not eligible on its own. Um, but we have a couple of <clears throat> large first-time donors, since we're just starting up, um, who would be willing to support, to, to give money to a more established organization if they were going to use it for intermarried families and for a partnership with our organization, which would uh, um, facilitate such outreach. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm wondering, I mean, it's sort of a complicated way of doing it, but Presumably, there are people out there, maybe even on this phone call, organizations who are still trying to find that one donor. Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> this is Karen, <laughs> by the way. Karen who? Just, What's your last name? Karen McGinnity. I was just going to say, um, if anybody is interested in <laughs> Alexa, for voicing that, I, I love that you just did that. Um, if anybody is interested in talking to Eliza, please yes. email and we'll connect you. Please. Um, 
can you just tell me the name of your organization? Yes, it's the Love and Tradition Institute. Oh my goodness, I've never heard of that. Okay. <laughs> well, I'll send you the link. Okay. <laughs> um, and anyone else out there, um, the organization that I started is a, it's a outreach tool basically um, for connecting any members or users of a website, members of an organization or users of a website. So um, it's a platform. So if anyone is interested, uh, get my information from Melissa uh, yep. because we're looking for partners and we do have a couple of large donors who would be willing to give money if it were to build a real, like a long-term partnership. Awesome. That's great. Oh, I'm so glad that that happened. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask it privately because it seems kind of bold and um, complicated at the same time. Um, but I figured there might be someone out there who's looking for this kind of thing. Yeah. Yes, and w we have to talk. There's so much potential for synergy here. I, I can't even tell you right yes, now. Also, there, I'm getting a couple. I think I'm getting a couple of emails of people who are interested. So I'm going to I'm going to connect okay. all of you, and <laughs> you guys can all figure that out offline on your own. See who's the highest bidder. And <laughs> I'm just kidding. But okay, but Melissa, you get credit. You get credit for the shidduch. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> um, and if there are three shidduchs, you go to heaven. Isn't that right? That, that's <laughs> like cool. that, or whatever oh, the cool. whatever the that thing is. is. Kind of, that is kind of the thing. Um, <laughs> Um, Karen, did you have another question? I see your hand is raised. Uh, I, I did, but <laughs> somehow it evaporated after. No problem. Uh, <laughs> um, gosh. Oh, it had to do with research, I remember. Okay. Based on um, our email earlier this week or last, I was thinking about um, connecting or potentially partnering with one of the universities, uh, either that uh, I'm currently affiliated with, or previously affiliated, um, and I just wanted to ask if you could expand a little bit on what you'd mentioned in terms of uh, Genesis JFN being interested in funding research. Maxine, do you want to speak to that at all? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, it, I, I think that it wasn't our initial thought about doing this. But as we moved into it, we started thinking about research that would have practical application. Mm -hmm. Looking at, thing, at research that would be able to uh, elevate best practices um, or, and that institutions, organizations, small or large, could use in terms of uh, improving their own practice. So, um, you know that that's an initial thought of the type of research that uh, would be interesting. Uh, you know, along with anything else, I, I don't know what you're thinking about, but you know that's where our our thinking had been in terms of, you know, po the possibility. Mhm. Mm okay. That that is that helps. Thanks for the clarification. Great. Karen, I'm just looking at your stuff. I'm so excited. <laughs> Amazing. Um, Ariel, do you want to ask your question just in case somebody's not looking at a screen? Oh uh, yeah, hi. Um, how? I mean, what are the chances of getting funding for specific programs versus funding for general operation? Uh, general oper operation of the organization. We're talking about an organization that generally um, um, all the programming is actually geared towards intermarried families. Oh, it is. But, yeah. So, I mean, let's say 80%. So should, I, should we then pitch a program, or sh should we then pitch? Can we pitch for the whole, like for, for operational money? Maxine, any thoughts? Um, okay, so we had said that an organization that was dedicated to this um, uh, issue would be eligible for uh, operating funds. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're eighty percent dedicated to it. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Are you 80% eligible? Um, I I guess it, you'd have to create a more specific context, but yeah. there is opportunity there, obviously. Um, you know, and asking about what's the chance, we we can't at this point tell anybody the chance of anything because we don't know what's going to be submitted. Yep. Yeah. Um, right. No, but I mean, just in general, like what 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 would it be worth to submit? I'm I'm, I'm, I'm I work for the Jewish Committee in Helsinki, and actually. 
let's say 95% of the couples are intermarried? Well, I would say if 95% of what your organization is doing is related to that, then mm-hmm. you, you, obviously you'd fall into the category of having, uh, you know, of being able to ask for some operating funds. Uh, you know, right. if an organization was doing this as 10% of their work or 20 or 50, it's not eligible. Right. And mm-hmm. the other the other point, I, thank you, Maxine, the other point I wanted to make is that you can submit more than one application. I believe we said up to two. Um, yeah. And so if there's a specific program you want to fund, you can apply for that specific program. And Ariel, for you specifically, um, and for organizations that are specifically devoted to or specifically mission-based in intermarry in engaging intermar- the intermarried community, you can all you could submit an application for general operating as well, um, and then. And then we would have to read them both and see. Um, obviously, we can't, as Maxine said, we have no way of commenting on on chances or the applicant pool or anything until after March 15th. Right, um, that makes sense. There's a lot of, I mean, there's from what we're seeing and hearing, I mean, there's 22 of you on this call, um, including me and Maxine, so 20 people on the call um, who are all really interested in in just the FAQ piece and we've had i've i field probably 10 questions every day so there's a lot of there's a lot of interest there's just really no way of commenting on anything really specific until we see every all the applications and we'll be reviewing all of them at once so we'll probably be i mean we'll probably have we'll have a better sense once all the applications okay are thank you no problem um Diane do you want to ask your question to the to the line yeah, so my question was around um, your, uh, under the guidelines, it says national organizations with local chapters may apply as separate entities. Mm-hmm. Um, so I just wanted to, some clarification, I guess, on that. Um, remind me what organization you're with. The Holo Shown? Right, right. Um, so, like, we're based in San Francisco. We have an uh, a office in New York. Right. So... Did, is your off is your office considered a like a separate office? Yeah. I mean, yes. Yes, so I would say that if you wanted to if you wanted to submit an application for a San Francisco program and an application for a New York program, that would be perfectly appropriate. Okay, thank you. Does that help? Mm-hmm, yes. Okay, great. Does does anybody else have any questions? I'm not trying to rush you all off the line. I'm just wanting to make sure we answer everything. Hi, if, this is Nathaniel from Big Ten Judaism. Hi, Nathaniel. I wanted to follow up. I believe it was Josh's question about a donor who um, had been giving to general operating and now wants to give to a specific program. Mm-hmm. And I was wondering if the inverse would also count as a new donor, if someone had been giving for a specific program and now wants to give to general operating. And because our organization is primarily focused on interfaith families, right. would that also be counted as a new donation? Yes. Okay. Yes, and I assume that you you would be applying for general operating support? Correct. Okay, yes. Yes, we've decided that that is, mm-hmm. that when, if a donor mm-hmm. is giving new, mm-hmm. is giving their money to a new place, mm-hmm. that it's a new gift. Okay. Um we, as Maxine said, though, we are very, very one of the key pillars of this of this initiative is to broaden the philanthropic field. Mm-hmm. So, so we're interested. We will we'll want to see like repeat investment is important, and we'll want to see that um, that they're making a commitment. Mm-hmm. Okay, and then would that also count perhaps if? The donor was giving to one program, and then wanted to give to a different program, also focused on interfaith families. That I would. Is it a new program? Um. I I don't have any specific example in mind. I'm just, I guess, it's hypothetical. Um. I'd um, like to play that out a little bit further. Okay. I'd like right. to play that out a little further. All right. Well, we can follow up then. Sure. About that. Sure. Okay. And, and I think, if, Melissa, if I can just add, Please. what what I think is an important point in looking at that is we're not 
just moving money around right. from Thank one you. line to another. Mm-hmm. So, you know, that's really going to be Melissa's focus when she's mm-hmm. speaking to donors mm-hmm. and following up with the specifics. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Got it. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Maxine. I have a question. Sure, go ahead. This is Michael Shire at Hebrew College. Great. Uh, as I understand from a previous response, you have more applications than you may have funds to distribute. How are you going to make decisions as to how the fund will be distributed? Well, it's an excellent question. <laughs> I mean, we are hoping that we have more. I mean, obviously, we're hoping that we have more applications than than funds for just for the success of the initiative. It'll mean that really good work is being good work is being done in the field, and that there's a lot of interest. Um, we will be we are working through our grant process right now. Um, there are there's a set of eligibility criteria on our website that are really the baseline of is an organization eligible is a is a gift eligible does the application meet check all of those boxes um, and then once we have a have the docket of eligible eligible applicants then we'll move to the second set of criteria which are our desirability criteria things such as um, collaboration and partnership, um, capacity of the organization to implement the funding. Um, sorry, I'm just pulling them up so I cannot make them up as I go. Um, ongoing projects versus short-term projects, um, the size of an organization, um, the alignment of the organization with the goals of the matching grant, things of that nature um, will be evaluating on those criteria as well. Yes, so once that has been ascertained and you have more suitable and appropriate applications than you have funds, what then? I mean, I I don't know. <laughs> That's the honest answer. I um, I mean, the ch- there is a chance that not everything will be funded. And would you look at offering reduced funding to more organizations? Um, I can't. I, I can't speak to that until we are actually looking at the applications. All right, I think that'd be important to know as we go into the process, so that we know that there's a possibility we might be looking at reduced funding if we have applied for a certain level. Maxine, do you want to say speak? Well, to I don't that think anybody should apply thinking they're going to get the funds. So you know, I, I, you know, I don't mean to sound negative in any way, no. but it's, it's everything is subject to review and, you know, decision-making and looking at the criteria. So, um, you know, I think, yes, it's always possible you could end up with less money. And if you're asking is it a black and white, we'll either get 100% or nothing. Um, You know, obviously we have to look at it, but I'd say, yes, the possibility could be there that you could get less than you applied for. Great. That's very helpful. Thank you. Hi, it's Eliza again. Hi. I just want to, Eliza, before you ask your question, I just want yeah, to no, follow up on Maxine's point that again, um, you know, there is, there's always possib- like there's a possi- there's always a possibility, and um, but we're not making like there's no guarantees. It's really going to be based on. I mean, I hate to do that, and I hate to sound so vague and non-committal. I really do. It's not my personality at all. But in this case, like I re- like we really won't know. What the what the possibilities really are until we're looking at the full applicant pool. Right. So I think I think it's really important that as you're applying, you're applying with the intention of with the intention of running your program either way, just in case. You know. Mm-hmm. Eliza, go ahead. Oh, I just had a quick question about um, size. I, given the basic um, requirement that the organization has to have a budget of over 100K, mm-hmm. two questions. One, is that for the prior year, or is that for how, for how much time? And two, once you're over 100K, is bigger always better, or is it just over 100K is okay, and then we look at everything else? Um, I think over 100K is the baseline, and then we look at everything else. I think it's it's going to be more about your capacity to implement, mm-hmm. um, how you're going to execute, and how how you're going to evaluate. Those are going to be really key pieces. Okay. Okay. Karen, mm-hmm. what are your questions? 
So the first question is, and it kind of relates to what Eliza just asked, but it's different in the sense that I'm wondering about something that I've been hearing um, from potential donors uh, and specifically from CJP here in Boston, mm -hmm. which has to do with uh, funding being primarily um, given to large organizations um, or larger organizations, leaving um, very little, uh, if anything, for smaller ones um, that frankly need it the most. So my question to you is um, whether I, it, like with respect to wanting to broaden the philanthropy, um, kind of bring in new money, you know, whether there's an interest slash focus on trying to kind of seed the, the field with regard to new initiatives. You know what I'm saying? Because um, it's like the it the sense I have is that money has been going not you know obviously this is a new initiative, new process, but that money has uh, historically been go been funneled toward things that already have money, so mm -hmm. it makes it that much harder <laughs> for those who need it. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, no, I hear what you're saying. Um, I am going to say that in my mind we're not we haven't sort of we haven't created a ratio of how much money is going where. Um Maxine is that accurate? Uh yeah, I mean I you know I think to clarify look, this money is from you know two donors basically who put the money in the pot to uh, created and neither of them have expressed any uh, preference for large or small. So mm -hmm. it's it's a matter of looking at it when it comes in and and seeing what seems, you know, as as Melissa said, it has the most potential for success. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's that's good to know. My second question has to do with just. Uh, Wondering actually whether JFN uh, has reached out or if there's any effort underway to kind of uh, bring in the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative folks um, who have uh, communicated that you know they're going to be giving uh, whatever percentage of uh, their shares or income. Uh, to making the world a better place and whether there's a piece of that that might be channeled your direction, our direction? Um, we have not, mm -hmm. to the best of my knowledge, um, reached out to them in any way. Um, I mean, I can't really speak to it in terms of the future, but for right now we haven't. Okay. Um, um, but if you have, I mean, I would encourage anybody with a connection to mm -hmm. <laughs> to try to work that connection because I'm sure right. that they're I mean, they also are they also fall into this category. So Right. Mm -hmm. and have a new baby and all of those things. So Exactly. Yeah. So I, while, I, so I have to that say if be, if you know how to get to them, it's I it's this Maxine, I I think it's it's great. It's worthwhile to try mm -hmm. and reach out to them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I you know, we we just um I don't know if anyone's been following it, but we just had this uh campus tour mm -hmm. with Michael Douglas and Nathan Sharansky mm -hmm. who finished last night. Mm -hmm. And um if anyone's interested you can watch the live streaming even from the last one which was in at UC Santa Barbara last night. And uh Michael was you know, talking about intermarriage <laughs> and uh, I mean inclusion as part of uh uh, his messaging, and uh, so of course we invited uh, Mark Zuckerberg and his wife because we figured mm -hmm. we we're going to be at Stanford, so why not? I mm -hmm. mean, we got a very polite no, no, but you know, I, I maybe there is another way to raise mm -hmm. this, Chris. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I'm I'm delighted to hear that you invited them, and uh, you know, with a two-month-old, they may have um, their hands full at the moment, but I I have reached out to them and. Very recently, um, and I, you know, I haven't heard back uh, yet. Uh, emphasis on yet. I'm, 
I'll, I'll stay optimistic, um, but um, I'm glad to hear that you invited them at least, and I think, oh, um, you know, that there's the potential to, to make inroads there, and, and certainly as it relates to uh, the ways in which um, Mark Zuckerberg is in potentially influencing American uh, gender roles with regard to uh, work-life balance and the ways in which that might relate to Jewish parenting. I think it's uh, worthwhile. Mm-hmm. Anyway, just two no, cents. That's great. Thank you for raising it. Sure. All right. Um, anybody else? Everybody feel good about feel good about their applications? <laughs> everybody feel good about the next six weeks? Um, I'm already over. I'm already getting overwhelmed. Um, <laughs> I think that feels like feels like people had their questions answered. Am I correct? Mm-hmm. Yes. Thank you. Okay, great. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, as I said, I'm going to send out this PDF that's on your screen and all of my contact information again and the PDF of the application. And I'm going to connect those of you that ask to be connected to each other. And if you have any other questions, please feel free to please contact me night or day. I'm I'm accessible. <laughs> Thanks okay. very much. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Maxine. Are you still on?